we've really warmed the crowd up for you, Alonzo. I actually love that. I was listening, and uh, I don't know who this guy is that they allowed to get away with all the murders and everything, but the question is, why didn't he run for president? Because I'm not sure if you're aware <laughs> of it, but now being a criminal is considered an asset on the presidential trail, particularly <laughs> if you're guilty of numerous crimes. I, I think this guy had a shot. Yes. There's never been anything like this. It is true. It, uh, <laughs> it, it is an amazing thing in this new culture that we apparently are in, political culture, I mean, that uh, the stink never gets too bad for many voters. You know, it's a. Uh, well, it's comical. You know, you know, the toughest job in comedy, I'll tell you right now, writing for The Onion, because. <laughs> It's impossible to satirize. You can't write satire anymore. Anything you write probably happened. You know, just, you know, we've got a presidential candidate with 91 indictments against him. You've got, you know, a, a, a um, Supreme Court justices are actually for sale. And the, the worst thing about that is this billionaire it, down in Texas, he bought a black Supreme Court judge and then brought him on a boat. And that's not right. You can't be buying black people and taking them on boats, Mark. We have a history of that. Now, stop it's it. too on the nose for you, is what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's you, did you? you we had a story last hour that Robert Menendez, the guy who's a you know the uh, the gold bars, cash yeah. in the pocket Menendez from New Jersey, he's running again, probably just to raise money because you can raise money like you know like nobody's business when you run for for office. So you're right. Yeah, um, George the Kendall, money in they, politics. George Santos did not give any of the money back. You know, George walked away, but it wasn't like, here's the, George was like, no, no, I'm holding this for my next run for Senate. And uh, <laughs> you know what? At this point, at this point, anything Santos does, I'm in. I'm backing him. I don't, I don't care because George is. He, George he is has B-A-L-L-S's, man. Hey, Mark. It's George Santos here. Yeah. Uh, for my birthday, uh, Courtney got me a cameo from George Santos, which she was she was a divided mind on. But in the end, it got us some good drops. So. A lot of people are telling me you're a liar. Yeah. So uh, he has one achieved of the this weird notoriety. Uh, one of the biggest on cameo. He's making a, a ton of money there. I'm telling you, remember the movie Catch Me If You Can? That, sure. uh, yeah. That George is living that. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. And now he's talking about running again, as you said. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Why give I up? I think him and him and Bobert are going to run against each other. You talk about an election you can't vote in. <laughs> <laughs> talk about throwing heat. Uh, so you're coming to Cobbs uh, in San Francisco. Great room. We were just we just were talking to somebody else about Cobbs. I think it was last week, and they want to play Cobbs. They say it's one just it's just such a great room. Well, it's one of the classic comedy rooms, right? They, the uh, we lost unfortunately a lot of the old school rooms during the pandemic. The independent places that couldn't make it, you know, but they're still around the country. There are a few great independent comedy clubs, and the thing about Cobbs. Cobbs goes back to San Francisco's comedy fame, right? So many great comics and great voices have come out of San Francisco and Cobbs was there. So yeah, just being part of it, it the room has a vibe. There are certain rooms that have a vibe. This room has a vibe. So, so it's been great comedy throughout, you know, like I say, through the history of comedy, the days of San Francisco comedy competition, all these brilliant comic minds came from there. So I love, yeah, I love working at Cobbs. I love working the independent room. Another I love nice that you mentioned the history of Cobbs, you know, because when I was in San Francisco, Cobbs was in the marina, actually. In fact, uh, Tom Sawyer, the manager, used to call me when there was a great comic on stage and I'd run down there. And I saw, I saw Sam Kennison for the first time. Uh, but then Cobbs moved and... You know, now Cobbs, I, I love that you mentioned the history because now Cobbs in this location, I mean, it's not a new location, I don't think. I mean, how long have they, they've been here for a while now? Yeah, they've been um, here. I, I don't know exactly how long, but they've been in this location for a while. Yeah, but there still is that rich history. And San Francisco and the Bay Area did have that. I mean, it was in the 80s when I was there, it was 
I mean, well, you had Robin had already graduated out by the time I got there, but you had Dana Carvey and, you know, Rob Schneider and Warren Thomas and uh, all of these people who I just thought were, you know, were brilliant. You And that's just I a handful, say, Bobby Slayton, et cetera. Yeah. One of my uh, favorite comics and great friends is Greg Proops. Oh, San brilliant. Francisco comedy royalty, right? Absolutely Proops. brilliant. I mean, yeah. if, listen, if you want to a level of not give a shit. Can I say that on your podcast? You did, and it's okay, yes. He is, you know, proofs. Let me, Greg Proofs ain't worried about hurting anyone's feelings with the truth. I love that guy. And and he is the, the epitome of a San Francisco comic. You know, he's got style, he's individual, he's got a voice, and he's got something to say. I, San Francisco's a great comedy city. Yeah, and, and, and Proofs also has that, Thing that you find with other San Francisco comics, I think, and, and and comics generally, I think increasingly, and that is knowledge of so many different things. Like he has deep knowledge of cinema, and and you know he can get into politics. Proops is he is a, a remarkable. I mean, he's a, a I don't want to call him a one off, but he's an extraordinary guy. Like he's you know he's you know. Well, I'll tell you, um, his podcast is called The Smartest Man in the World. <laughs> right. And I always say, he might be, it's arguable. We we used to do a show here on NPR in LA, and it was called Comedy Congress. It was me, him, and Ben Glebe. And I told him, I'm only here to explain to the audience what Greg just said. That was <laughs> my just, let me translate this down to our level, because he's operating <laughs> Yeah, he is amazing. He he's truly a ninja. And 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 you know, Ben Glebe is one of those guys too. You you guys are all like you can really you've got chops in in knowledge of politics and you know, you can play that when you when you want to. And when the I mean, we've done TYT together and you've uh, you know, it's interesting though that you do at least in a lot of the clips I've seen, you put politics aside a little bit on stage. There'll be chunks of your act that has nothing to do with politics. You know, um, Lewis Black, another friend, another legend, told me one time, you have to give them a break. They can't think for the whole hour. So he said, you throw in something just to let them breathe for a minute and then hit them again. And I think that works. The other problem I have, honestly, Mark, the other problem I have and the reason I'm maybe I don't know if moving away is the right word, but the, oh man, you talk about being with comic royalty. Yeah, hanging out with him and Kathleen Madigan. That was in Montreal at Just for Laughs. Uh, awesome time. But the other thing I was going to say is, unfortunately, as a society, we're not moving forward. And it's tiring to, to say the same thing, like to still be dealing with the same racism the same, you know, the, the immigrant crisis. I have, I have a whole bit about it, like they're back. We we were mad at the immigrants a couple of years ago. Then we shifted and we were mad at the transgenders and the immigrants thought they could breathe. Nope, we're back to the immigrants <laughs> again. You know, it, it's, yeah. it's so as a comedian, you know, uh, we have to do another Trump election cycle. You know, it just honestly, Mark, it becomes tiring. It, it's our voice and it's our job. You know, Lou said it one time when they asked him, why do you talk about the news? He's like, we don't want to, but nobody else will. So we, you know, we're left with this job. And, and you know, I've told you before, I'm a huge fan of the jester, right? Because the jester was the only one who could make fun of the king and speak truth to power. And that's, that's the comic's job. But could we please move along I don't know if you're aware, Mark, but Congress is regulating TikTok because of all the mass TikTokings we've had at the high school. <laughs> oh, thoughts and prayers to all the mass TikToking. Not that there's another issue perhaps we should look at. No, 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 no. Let's stop TikTok. It is a <laughs> it is remarkable that you put it in those terms. That you know, we look at the youth and we look at these massacres in high schools and all these that we focus on TikTok instead of those other things. And then who is available to pick up TikTok if there's a divestiture on the part of ByteDance? Jared Kushner's expressed interest in moving in. So well, it's a good idea to have a private individual take over a social media company because, you know, we tried that once and it's worked so well. Yeah. Why would we not do it again? <laughs> it's. I think I said Kushner. I think it was Mnuchin, actually. Although I'm sure Kushner's expressed interest as well. But yeah, I mean, I, you'd see the 
the nakedness of all of this, of money and of, you know, pay to play, it, it's all so clear. And yet we, you know, we sort of are hanging here, Alonzo. It's a very scary time. I think, you know, I, 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 I know that the media generally for clicks and, you know, for eyeballs tends to hype things, but I feel as though real events live up to the hype now. Yeah, unfortunately they do. And, and you know, one of the things I've been saying, I've been yelling at the crowd, if you're under 40, vote. You have to vote. We have to get young people, like, you know, they're, they're trying to regulate TikTok. These are people who don't understand TikTok at all, have no idea what TikTok is. These are people who are still struggling with Facebook, all right? I mean, our government, you see the age of our government and the younger people need to step in because they understand their issues. They understand the future. And the unfortunate thing, and you know, I've done a lot of media stuff and I, I've worked with the LA Press Club for a few years and, and I've talked to real reporters and real media. And unfortunately they're held to a standard of clicks, just like you said. So you're trying to tell a real news story, but you're being judged by the same uh, metric as an Instagram influencer, you know, which would explain the boobs on the women doing the weather. Can we talk about <laughs> this for a minute? Because the women doing the weather are so hot. If you ask me what the weather report is, I have no idea, Mark. It's partly cleavage. That's all I know. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> yeah, it is insane, man. It's pretty insane. And I get it. I mean, I kind of get it. It's like, you know, the handsome dude telling you the news and the hot weather person, you know, telling you the five day forecast or whatever. Um, yeah, it, but you know, the, and we talk about this and again, you're, you're old enough to remember this. You remember when we had real news and you know, I'm listen, I was a little kid when Walter Cronkite was on the news, but I strongly suspect Walter Cronkite wouldn't have been trying to get clicks. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the, the beauty of Walter Cronkite land back then was there were only a couple of options, I think. So they were, you know, they didn't have to worry about that. And, and, and that had a positive effect on what they were able to do. You know, they were they felt a sense of public responsibility. I mean, journalism has changed. I mean, uh, in some ways it's changed in good ways because many more people can do investigative work and bring it to platforms like this or whatever it may be. There are many more open discussions about things that otherwise wouldn't be out in the open. But in another way, it's become so completely ruled by clicks, as you say, that, you know, you don't have any institution, network, program or other that isn't worried about making money. And so the minute it's well, about making money, you've sacrificed your journalism oftentimes. Listen, Just I get that. And and I get, yeah, there is niche media now, whether it be podcast, you know, podcasts and online media things. You mentioned TYT and stuff like that, you know, and that's all good. But but the main media, okay, enough of this nonsense about mainstream media and all that. Network media should have a responsibility. They should be held to a different standard than a podcast, right? And and as I read recently and reposted, I don't know who wrote it, but he said, listen, when one person says it's raining and another person says it's not raining, your job isn't to report both. Your job is to go look out the window and tell us if it's raining. And that's what they've lost. I Listen, fine with all the niche media, if you wanna go to an extreme right wing site or an extreme left, or you have a certain way, you know, listen, I, I love international news. You, you'll get a more honest view of the United States from Canada or from, from the BBC than you will from anything here, you know? Uh, by the way, the United States of America is the number one reality show in Canada. I don't know if you're aware of that. <laughs> they absolutely love it. Yes, they legalized weed through the entire country so that every afternoon they can get high and watch us. We have we get great ratings up there, Mark. But <laughs> <laughs> they can't believe it. They can't. Well, uh, you'll remember, by the way, uh, when Trump was president, Justin Trudeau was very much in the whole uh, game, right? There was a whole thing playoff between Trudeau and uh, and Trump. It was and a, through a, through a crazy coincidence, I met Justin Trudeau while I was on a comedy tour in Canada. We were in Ottawa. We were invited to parliament. He was there and I met him, which is insane, right? Because you can't just meet the, the president of the United States without six background checks. They, we were at lunch and they asked me, they said, hey, you want to meet Justin Trudeau? I'm like, 
yeah, why not? My afternoon's open. But um, I met him, very nice guy. I talked to him, and I said to him back then, listen, if I need to get up here, I'm using your name. And he was okay with that. So I got I got a guy, Mark. You know you know how it is. You can't get you in. You got to have a guy. guy. You, I, I know you got to have a guy. Absolutely. I got and, a guy. Uh, <laughs> the weather, I'm going to say, would would scare you back south, yeah, but I don't know, maybe not. I hey, I love that you spent some time, and, and I also remember on the way out here, our last minute with Alonzo Bowden, we've had your um, Cobbs date up there the whole time, so hopefully people will find you at Cobbs in San Francisco on the 27th, but I remember that you used to work on jet engines, isn't that right, Alonzo, or used to? Oh, yeah, I worked in aerospace. I, I built... Um... The most famous thing I worked on, and it's funny because it's famous now and it was a secret then, but the original stealth fighter, the F-117, um, I worked on it when it was a top secret project in the early 80s. So, wow. Uh, uh, yeah, so as you see parts fall off of the, look at you. There you that, was, that was on a tour in Iraq. That was I've, me cleaning I've, the windshield of, of a uh, helicopter before I got in and we flew off, which... You know, shout out to the troops. They, that's the F-117. Yeah, I worked on those. Um, the troops, uh, well, I, and, you know, always an honor to entertain them. And oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's a an, an experience that's, you know, in a class by so, itself. Yeah, uh, what you're talking about now, you know, pieces just falling off of Boeing jets. I mean, John Oliver did a great piece on it. And, and what's going on is you have subcontractors doing work for subcontractors underneath subcontractors like back in the 80s back when i worked in aerospace there were so many inspectors and inspections and you had to you had to match the lockheed inspector then you had the federal the military inspector you know and things had to be checked by both and and so on but again as john oliver pointed out and as you know and everyone knows what drives our society now stock price that's all they, you know, so when you're more worried about the stock price than airworthiness, and you, you see the airlines do it too, right? What did the airlines do? They got all that bailout money during the pandemic. They reinvested it. They bought their own stock. And now they're like, oh, well, we don't have any pilots or flight attendants. Oh, could it be because you pocketed the money? Uh, so, you know, I The other thing, the Alonzo, I would just say is that the regulatory system that is designed to keep these production lines honest. I mean, we've now seen these reports from whistleblowers inside the production of uh, these Boeing jets that suggest, I mean, it's beyond um, malfeasance. It's a, it's utter negligence. I mean, they're, they're putting discarded parts back onto Boeing aircraft in the, this is to, the to save time. There are a few problems, right? One is lack of competition. There's only two companies in the world that build passenger jets. And the other is, you know, uh, it, no accountability, right? Because it's a corporation. So, so, you know, this guy or that woman or this boss or that, who do you blame? Because they're, well, I work for so-and-so and then I work for this and that. And so there's no direct accountability except for, you know, you know, who the, and they'll hang this person out to dry. The mechanic who puts the part on and signs off on the paperwork not you know he didn't build it he bolted it on you know what i mean it's like if you if you needed uh brake pads for your car and some guy puts the brake pads on and the brake pads are crap well he doesn't make the brake pads he's just doing his job he didn't know that the part he had to assume the part you gave him was good so this is what's going to happen i promise you they're going to end up hanging it on some some poor sucker who works on the production line while the the vice president and the president or here's a great one mark you want a good job get fired as a ceo come on these golden <laughs> parachutes your your whole your whole career is spent trying to move to the top so you can get fired and skip out with 20 million dollars so now, true how does that work <laughs> it's absolutely true it's wild it is absolutely true oh, forced resignation and cut them a check yeah. Uh, I love having you on. Come see us again. Again, your date at Cobbs is the 27th. Tony, you can put it back up there if you, uh, but we've, we've had it up there for most of the conversation, but uh, I, it's a treat to see you. There it is. Alonzo Bowden, actor, comedian. We haven't even touched the 
surfaces so many things we could speak to you about. So you'll come back and visit. Tour dates at alonzoboden.com. And again, Cobb's in the city on the 27th. Look at you. Thank you so much, Mark. I yeah. love talking to you. Hey, and thanks for bringing me up to date on murders. Um, <laughs> I, I may not be spending the night in San Francisco. Maybe I need to get in and get out. I'm not sure what's yeah. going on. <laughs> the history in San Francisco isn't all comedy. We'll say that. All right. Uh, love you, Alonzo. See ya. Alonzo Appreciate Bowen, you, everybody. my friend. Thank you. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.